He always offers this. Thank you. Um, all right, here we go. So for people that uh, may not have heard about uh, Vessel Incidental Discharge Act or VITA, some people call it VITA. Uh, I like VITA, like the like VITA loco thing. Uh, but anyways, it was uh, passed in 2018 called the Frank Lombiando Coast Guard Authorization Act of 2018. Um, it was passed uh, by the Senate with a 94 to 6 vote and passed by the House by uh, an agreed by voice vote with no objection. So this uh, represents a very significant uh, compromise, um, uh, bipartisan legislation, uh, working with the states for a long period of time, and it was signed by the president into law uh, in 2018. So I'm going to talk briefly about what are discharges incidental to the normal operation of a vessel, which is what uh, the VITA is all about. A brief history of, of ballast water and uh, the discharges and uh, what are the key provisions and next steps. So when we think about uh, vessels and we're thinking about invasive species, the first one that always comes to mind is ballast water. And obviously these are big vessels, ballast water comes in, our wonderful uh, friends, the zebra quagga mussels came over in ballast water into the Great Lakes, and here we are. Uh, so, the, But there's other things that come off of a vessel that we're very concerned about, both for invasive species as well as water quality. So uh, they can come from lots of different parts of the vessels. And then some of the other ones that deal with invasive species, uh, hull husbandry, that's the biofouling, the stuff that attaches to the bottom of the, of the vessel, um, seawater piping, the stuff, you know, you have these piping that take raw water in and then uh, go into the cooling systems and ballast systems, all that stuff that's interconnected, you could have um, biofouling in there, anchor chain from sediments and other things that are on there. But you also have uh, water quality issues, uh, sonar dome, effluent, water deck washdown, gray water, bilge water, fuel spills, material storage, all these things are um, got wrapped into this act, which makes it very difficult because, you know, my agency deals with the invasive species. Well, I have another agency that deals with the water quality aspect. And I know, you know, as I've tried to bring other people up here, it's like, well, you know, talk to your colleagues in your state that deal with water quality. This is a big issue. This isn't just about coastal Voy this isn't uh, just about coastal boats. This is any navigable water in the United States. Great Lakes, you know, Mississippi River, anything that's big enough that, that a 79 foot and greater size commercial vessel can go on, that's what this um, covers. So when, again, when we talk about what this uh, encompasses, there's 31 uh, technology-based discharge categories of effluent. Um, so the biggest ones, again, based on the, the photo that you just saw, the ballast water, uh, chain hold, fuel spills and things, these are also things that the Coast Guard regulates. So this, this act came together because the industry was not very happy that you had two federal agencies and all the different states that had regulations for these vessels. So there was, they were trying to bring uniformity and there's good reasons why the states had uh, different standards and such. But that's all past now, we're into this next session. So what's, just again a reminder, what comes in ballast water? We know about zebra quagga mussels, but there's bacteria, there's viruses, phytoplankton, zooplankton, larvae of lots of different species that can come in here. So we wanna be very careful. Um, in the West Coast, we work very closely together, California, Oregon, Hawaii, Alaska. And so uh, there's quite a bit of differences, like if California has the highest number of arrivals, uh, and they have 11.1 .1 million metric tons of discharge annually on average. Washington has the next highest arrivals, but we have the highest volume of uh, ballast water discharge because we're more of an export state. So vessels come in more loaded with ballast water. This uh, just matrix uh, just sort of help emphasize the complexity of what uh, the VITA encompassed. So on your, on your left side are all the different sort of the players, international maritime organizations, the states, Coast Guard, EPA, and Congress. They're all big players in this. And then the timeline going back from uh, the, the 70s, uh, 89, obviously with zebra quagga mussels coming in, that was a really big driver for creating the legislation that, that started the whole ballast water management. And as we move uh, to the right, uh, more of the different players start coming in and more of the regulatory aspect of, of management comes into play, primarily for ballast water. This is primarily ballast water at this point. 
So in the more recent history, um, we've, um, in the first parts of 2010 to 2014, you start seeing a lot more uh, of Congress starting to enact different uh, bills to try to manage this system, trying to make it streamlined, uniform, basically preempting states from being able to uh, have higher standards in their areas. And then 2015 and 2019, then it really started cranking up. And if you can see down in the, in the lower right part there, there was like 23, more than 23 individual legislative bills that were uh, positioned or you know, brought forward. And each one of them, we have to track and find out what's the difference with the previous version. How did things change? How did they not change? It's a different committee. It's you know, how things are moving forward. So it's a very complex system that, uh, that uh, created this bill. So what are the provisions? It was passed. So now, um, <laughs> so it's, it's a phased in approach here. Over the next four years, uh, there are no changes to the existing regulations. States still have their laws. Coast Guard has their laws, EPA has their laws, and in the next four years, in the first two years, EPA is supposed to set their, their uh, environmental standards for all those, thir those 31 uh, in discharge uh, streams. And then in the next two years after that, Coast Guard is going to implement rules to, to uh, enforce, the, you know, create the regulatory parts of how these things are, those standards are going to be applied to each of the vessels and then how they're going to enforce them. So it's a four-year process. And then once those four years are up, then the states cannot have more stringent standards than what's current, than, than what's available in the, in the rule. We, uh, through very significant intense negotiations, we were to, we retained our authorities to enforcement of all federal standards and requirements. This is very important. We, you know, even if all the, even if all these standards are really the top notch, everybody knows when you stay out, get out there enforcing things, you can only have so much resources to apply that. And the states are very, you know, want to be able to have the authority to get out there and, and, and enforce this as well. Um, we retained the Pacific Coast um, Ballast Water Exchange and other key provisions that we've established in, in our areas, and we made them federal requirements as well. Uh, we retained our ability to collect management fees, uh, and uh, the regulation of small commercial vessels and fishing vessels it was taken out of VITA. That was another big piece, where they were just basically going to say any, any vessel that's 79 feet or smaller, and any fishing vessel of any size was basically, there are no regulations left. And so we were, we were happy to have that pulled out. So we also gained a few uh, authorities here. One is consultation required with uh, EPA and Coast Guard in establishing the standards and, and the requirements. Uh, we have a, a, a petition for uh, higher federal standards and requirements. And uh, we've improved the dissemination of the National Ballast Information Center Clearinghouse uh, reporting data and annual reports and working group uh, to form real-time ballast water data sharing with the Coast Guard. These are things that are in the bill. And so now we're trying to implement this. So what happened at the beginning of this year? Federal shutdown. <laughs> So that uh, put things uh, away a, a bit far beyond, and just recently uh, EPA started coming forward and saying, uh, let's do consultation. They had a couple webinars. Um, we've said that's not really sufficient uh, consultation. We feel that VITA was very clear in the level of consultation with states that were required. So this is still something that's ongoing. Uh, what is federal state consultation, and what does that mean? We're also, so that's, we're in, this, in the second bullet there, uh, establishing the process and timeline. And then, um, again, I said the Coast Guard will establish their own consultation process, and the Coast Guard has started that. They've issued a, a request for leads, designated leads from each state that want to be the primary contacts in, in this consultation process. Um, we still have to develop the whole state petition process, and then Congress needs to appropriate funds for the Coastal AIS Mitigation Grant Program, and I'll go over that in just a little bit. So regarding federal state consultation, um, this is a letter that uh, the Western Governors Association issued in September 9th, 
And uh, basically, it's just saying uh, what I said. We don't believe that the consultation process that the EPA has laid out is sufficient to meet the intent of VITA. And uh, the states are ready and willing to partner with EPA and Coast Guard in doing this. Obviously, you know, it seems like four years is a long time, but when you talk about rulemaking processes, co uh, EPA has to issue their draft uh, rules probably in January. And so they're trying to get everything ready to push into that. They're saying they don't, you know, they can't do the consultation with the states in addition. So there's a lot of pushback and forth. What are we doing? How are we doing it? We want to be co-partners, co-regulators co in this situation. So we also uh, worked with our uh, Pacific region colleagues, uh, California, Hawaii, and Oregon, and issued a letter as part of the consultation process about technical standards. And the three big ones that we were focusing on is establishing ballast water management discharge standards based on best available technology economic, economically achievable. It's a mouthful, but it basically is saying there's a lot of good data out there that the current system is inadequate and uh, start using some of the real data that's available out there. And the and EPA was criticized and had a su lawsuit on this uh, in the last round about that they weren't using the most current uh, best available technology. Another problem with that is all the data that's being collected by the Coast Guard uh, to test, to type approve ballast water systems is not being made available. E even to EPA, which would be very important in being able to say whether this current discharge standard is, is, is adequate or not, because all these systems are being tested, and they're being tested to the one standard, but they're also getting lots of information and like, well, you could actually have a, a more stringent standard, and most of these, best, these treatment systems could meet that standard, but we don't know that because they won't release this data. So it's a, a part of our um, negotiations that continue. We're also very concerned about vessel biofouling and a regulation of in-water cleaning. So the biofouling is the stuff that's attached to the boat that's coming in and going out, no management at all, it's not being discharged, it's just coming in and out. California has a great program and uh, we're trying to follow that lead. There's some differences of opinion of what is included in this or not, but the a big one here is in-water cleaning. You know, when they actually come in and they wanna scrape off all that stuff into our waters, that's a big concern. Uh, that's a very direct release, and we want to make sure that, that uh, those standards are very strict. And I have a case study I will briefly show you. Short term, um, we also, there's provisions in there about emergencies and further protection of water quality provision. All these things are things that we need to keep moving forward to, to negotiate with and talk about, and how are they going to implement them. There's a lot of work to be done to implement this bill. Um, and things like a work group to be in consultation. None of these have actually been done yet, and we're, we're trying to keep moving forward with it. So I did wanna focus a little bit on this. This is the Coastal uh, AIS Mitigation Grant. It's money for us, it's money for the coast. Um, it's actually, there's money you could use for the Great Lakes as well. It's $5 million subject to appropriation, little asterisk there, and, um, and it also would include any penalties that the Coast Guard issues to vessels would be added to that. This is, um, there's a lot of eligibilities here for the states, local governments, tribes, NGOs, academia. It's pretty broad open, and, um, and it can be used for multiple purposes here. It's a very important piece, but unfortunately, it was sort of a tag-on provision here. It's not EPA's duty, it's not Coast Guard's duty, it's somebody else's duty, and we're trying to track it down so that we can actually get this grant uh, funding available to the states. So just lastly here, here's a case study that's just happening, it's actually happening right now. So this is a floating dry dock. It's ADL, AFDL 45. It was built in 1945 as part of the World War II efforts. Uh, it's in, been in Washington since 1981. The new owner is um, in Hawaii, and they want to take this to Hawaii for uh, their business there. Um, it's been estimated by surveyors that it has like three and a half uh, tons of biofouling attached to the bottom. It also has a lot of ballast water and sediments because um, this, this is a system that actually you pump in water, the whole thing sinks down into the water, the boat comes on, they pump out the ballast water, it floats up underneath it, and now you have a floating dry dock and you can work on your boats. So all that stuff 
40 years sitting in our, in our bay, sediments in the ballast tanks, everything like that, they want to take it to Hawaii. Working with our colleagues in Hawaii on this, uh, the, the owner, the new owner did the right thing. They contacted Hawaii and said, hey, we got this new thing, we want to bring it over. Do you have any problems with that? It's like, yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, so, um, you know, so I've been working with our colleagues there. It, there's no regulation in my state that says, thou shalt clean this before you leave. And so, you know, in Hawaii, they're having similar problems. You know, it seems like this would be a no-brainer. Like, you wouldn't want this coming into your, your harbor, would you? But it's, it's one of those areas, and, and Chris talked about, these are mobile, uh, say it again? Mobile marine infrastructure. Remember that. Remember, that's a very important term. Mobile marine infrastructure. So there's a lot of this stuff that's, that's going around under the radar because um, this is not a vessel as defined. It doesn't have a number. It's not being registered by anything because it's been tied up to a dock. But as soon as it cuts loose from that dock, it becomes a vessel. Most people don't really understand that. So we're working with them. Uh, with Hawaii, we're working with the, the, the new owner, and we've uh, in, now brought in uh, EPA Region 10 and the Coast Guard Puget Sound sector, and they're doing an awesome job. And this is, this is a hallmark of coordination and communication amongst federal and state agencies. I want to bring that forward really clearly. This is what we need to do. This is why we need both of us together working together. We can put, put this information together. We can go. So the Coast Guard issued a captain of the port order, said, you cannot leave this Washington until you your your hull is cleaned and your ballast tanks have been cleaned. That's huge. Um, EPA has said you can't clean this in the middle of the ocean because that's ocean dumping and there's a different regulation for that. These are huge pieces that are that are that we're working together and I really appreciate that and that's 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 where I want Vita to go as well. That's